our series this evening. We are glad you were able to join us. Those who are in the sanctuary, welcome. And to those who are on the air, we welcome you as well. Help us now to sing in praises to our God, who has been good to us. We hope that you will join us and raise your voices wherever you are. As we go into singing, we would like to pray to say, Dear Father, we thank you for this opportunity to praise you. And as we come in your presence, we pray that your holy angels will tabernacle with us, join us in the singing, and may your name be praised now and always. This is our prayer in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. And we'll start with hymn number 286, Wonderful Words of Life. over again to me wonderful words of life let me more of their beauty see wonderful words of life words of life and beauty teach me faith and duty beautiful words wonderful words wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all, wonderful words of life. Sing a list to the loving God, wonderful words of life. So freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life, offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life, Jesus only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And our next song is number 
promises of Christ my Savior, send me, send me. And standing on the promises of God. Ten, and the last one, the 604, we know not the hour. Good evening, everyone. I'm finding it difficult to find the words suitable to express my delight at welcoming you, having the opportunity to welcome you to this session of the Advent Message Masterclass. This is the third session, third lecture of the third weekend. So this is session number nine of the series. And we know that we're going to have a wonderful time together as we expand our knowledge of the history of our church. This evening's session will take, in keeping with the design of the program, a historical slant. Yesterday we had a session on the development of the youth work um, of the church, very suitable for our celebration of Pathfinder Day. This evening, we will be looking at one of the seminal conferences, one of the, one of the red letter general conference sessions of the church in 1888. Um, we know that there is a lot of exciting information, a lot of exciting learning in which we are going to engage as we, as we participate in this evening's session. I really want to welcome everybody who is here in the sanctuary, 29 Hope Road. I want to welcome everybody who is on the YouTube channel of the Andrew Seventh day Adventist Church. Also want to welcome everyone who is on the, the you, the YouTube channel of the East Jamaica Conference. Um, we know that by whatever means you're watching, you are going to watch, even for those who are not joining live, but we'll watch later on, that you are going to be truly blessed by the proceedings this evening. Will you bow your head with me while we pray? Eternal God, our Father, we marvel at your goodness. We are amazed at your faithfulness to us in the face of our, unfaithfulness, unfaith, our faithlessness and unfaithfulness to you. We ask for a special blessing on this session this evening 
that your Holy Spirit will be present among us in a powerful way to inspire and energize both the principal lecturer and each one of us as we listen so that true teaching and learning can take place. Bless our time together, bless our fellowship, and bless the ministry of your word to our hearts and to the hearts of all those who will hear. Be with us now in a special way, we pray, in Jesus' name. We really want to leave as much time as is possible to our principal lecturer. Um, so we're going to get right into things. Um, he is going to come to us immediately after our praise team, consisting of Faileen Lawson. I don't name her first for any particular reason. Sister Celine Giles and Dr. Jerome Stern, after they will have sung the theme song. Let me just mention, um, as Pastor Oliphant has continued to lecture, there is less and less need for an introduction. Pastor Oliphant has been here at Andrews Seventh-day Adventist Church as our senior pastor for just over a year. And he has established a formidable record as a, a man of great energy, man of great passion, great love for the world. We know this is going to be exhibited again as he speaks to us this evening. And we are looking forward to a special time together with him. Please pray for him as he prepares to come. Praise team is going to take us over the mountain as once again they assure us that we are nearing home. Sister, will you meet us there in the 
land of sunshine and there be no care. Accept of God's message and to Him be true. Then when Jesus comes, He will call for you. We are living for it. See the glory streaming through the gates ajar. Very soon we'll enter never more to roam. Hear the angels singing, we are nearing home. We are nearing home. Oh, we are nearing See the splendor gleaming from the domes afar. See the glory streaming through the gates ajar. Very soon we'll enter never more to roam. Hear the angels singing, we are nearing home. We are nearing home. Our principal lecturer is getting ready to come on. Have no fear. Um, in the meantime, in the meantime, since there is no, since there is no possibility of praising God too much, um, we're just going to ask you to sing again the last verse of the theme song and the chorus. Yes, you can come on. You can, you can. church say amen good evening everybody a little late in one minute uh, thank you so very much for your kind regards this weekend um, some of you are praying heavily for this program 
and I'm happy for that. Um, I was told them to be up at 7.30 this evening. So my team and I were there, and uh, I, I, I don't know, well, uh, I, was, I was given the 7.30 time. So we were praying, and I want those of you who are online to know that we are, in fact, praying for you in sanctuary. Uh, we do have a prayer team that every time we actually meet, they are actually right here in sanctuary. They are putting your prayer requests before God. They are interceding on your behalf. They are petitioning the throne of grace and asking God to hear from heaven your, your specific request and to be able to answer according to his sovereign will. So you can open the chat and you can place in the chat, even right now the team has put in it, if you want Bible study, if you want to learn more about Jesus, if you want to learn more about the Advent message, then I want you to fill out that card and send it right in to us. And this week, we will be in touch with you. This week, I'll be making lecturers' calls. So uh, if you give me your number, then I will be calling you this week. The lecturer will be calling you live this week um, for you to actually share with us and for you to share with me your particular points of view as we study and as we share. I, I am happy to be here this evening, and I just want to say a very special thank you to all the individuals who are watching also on the East Jamaica Conference virtual church platform with us streaming each evening. And you know that's uh, Sunday evenings in particular that I'm speaking of because Wednesday evening it's tutorial via our Zoom platform. And so I want you to keep that in mind. Last, yesterday, we focused on uh, the, the Christian church, an overview of the, the, the history of the Christian church from AD 30, uh, its establishment on the day of Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit came in full power and presence and showers of blessing upon the people that were then gathered from all across the then known world. And uh, we, 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 we advanced through the three, four epochs of church history. And we looked at the fact that October 31st, 1517, uh, became the dividing marker for the modern Christian church, the modern Christian um, dispensation, where today we are actually focused on the Reformation. The Reformation was very important to the shaping, the enlightenment, the unfolding of true Christian doctrine. And it was a call to go back to the book of the Bible, a call to primitive godliness as outlined in particular in the New Testament scriptures in the early Christian church. And you would have found yesterday that I would have highlighted one particular individual. His name is Paul. And rightly so, because Paul has contributed significantly to the growth, and not just to the growth in terms of church planting and the raising up of leaders, but the Apostle Paul also has contributed much, even to this very day, in relation to our knowledge of Scripture, our understanding of Jesus Christ and of the message that was committed to him for the early Christian church. That's very critical, critical in our dispensation and critical in our day. And we looked on the fact that not everybody understands the writings of Paul. And in fact, if you are supposed to take the writings of Paul and look at any particular paragraph, for example, uh, not, not paragraph, any particular chapter in the book of Romans, you'll realize the intellectual uh, depth and the intellectual gymnastics, if you will, that he plays with both language and theological concept. 
in helping individuals to understand the word of the living God. And we're going to build on that concept this evening. We're going to delve into it from another angle, from another perspective. A perspective that is very close to the heart of the Advent message. A perspective that awakens a, a, a humbling experience in the life of the early pioneers of this Advent movement. And I think you're going to enjoy this evening's lecture, hopefully as much as I enjoy speaking about it. And so I invite you to stand with me as we pray to begin this evening's lecture. And so now, Lord, we come to that time, that moment when we just lay aside everything else and we drink from the fountain of life. Take the words of my mouth and the silent, quiet meditation of my heart and make them acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. So come with me this evening. Let me see if my team is right up there with me. <laughs> this evening we're going to be looking on. So there are some critical dates that you need to know by the time you end the course. The first date, let me see who in the chat. Let me talk to those who are in the chat because these people are already here, you know. In the chat, 1860, what happened? 1860. Um, that's the date number one, 1860. Date number two, 1863, what happened? Advent movement, Advent message, Advent pioneers, what happened? 1860, what happened? I, I've been, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been uh, stating these dates over and over. So let me just give you a midweek, a mid-season uh, quiz, a pop quiz. 1860, what happened? Let me see who in the chat can tell me. 1863, what happened? Uh, October 1844, what happened? I think we're, we're very well delayed. 1844, what happened? No, I don't want you. you, you so how are you answering that one and you skip over the other ones that I give you before? I don't understand you. You all think on the bright here, you know. You know, you, <laughs> yes. All right, so those are some critical dates, very important dates. Let's go again. 457 BC, what happened? AD 30, what happened? <laughs> I've given you some critical dates, you know. Critical dates, pop quiz, pop quiz. All right, Mary Smith says, Naming of the SDA denomination 1860 and 1863 formally formed denomination of SDA. Yes, man. Give Sister Mary a tick. She got that. Yes, Mary, I got the ticky. You see me? You see, I give it to you. Yes, you get the ticky. Um, so that's 1860, 1863. Where, which other date did I give you now? 1844. I don't want Mary to answer this one. I need somebody else. To answer this one 1844 what happened 1844 457 bc what happened which one you're answering 1844 and you're saying the great appointment you're correct <laughs> you're correct though the great disappointment 1844 claire palmer says ad 30 the christian church was born all right can work with you on that one um, October, let me go with 457 BC. I think I dealt with that last week. Or was it the week before? Um, 457 BC. What happened in 457 BC? The what? The last decree to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. You got your ticky. You got your ticky. Stacy Henry Curtis says, 1844, great disappointment day. You are correct. And so I gave you, I think, one other day. October 31, 1715. What happened on that date? October 31, 1715. No, 1517. 
15, 17. I mixed up that a while ago. What was that? What did what, what happened? He nailed it 95 theses to the door at where? Wittenberg. And that started what? What did that start? The, the period known as the what? Reformation. And the Reformation is what era of um, church history? The, the beginning of the modern Christian church. Correct. So this evening, we're going to be picking up on where I was on Sabbath yesterday. And we're going to be looking on today another important date. The 1888 Minneapolis Conference. The 1888 Minneapolis Conference. So, let's do a quick recap. Last, yesterday, we looked on the fact that the law... What does the law do, number one? It, what does the law do? It reveals sin. It does what, church? Reveals sin. Without the law, there is no what? Knowledge of sin. And we said grace, on the other hand, erases what is sin. Grace comes and saves us from sinful life. The law a man is saved without it. That's what the Apostle Paul says. That a man is saved without the deeds of the law. But grace, a man is saved by what? By grace, through faith. The law is not nullified because of grace. The Apostle Paul asks the question, shall we then, does, the, does it then make the law void and he answers and he says what no rather we do what establish the law grace therefore is not an excuse to continue doing what living in what in sin so if it's not an excuse to living in sin it means that we must when we are saved we keep the law not to be saved but because we are saved. Number four, four, the wages of sin, the wages of the transgression rather, of the law is what? Death. And where do we get that? Sin is a what? Transgression of the what? Of the law. So we are sinners because we commit. Come on, say it with me. We are sinners because we commit sin and everybody in christianity accepts that we are sinners but grace on the other hand whereas the wages of sin is death grace is a what grace is a what a gift do you work for a gift hmm? you don't work for a gift you receive a gift from a part of love so the gift of its presence, of the presence of grace, is eternal life. Now, I said yesterday that in Christianity, there have been some topics which are difficult and hard to understand. And anyone who is a Christian must ask his or herself a particular question. You must question your faith. You must look on the doctrine and, and question it. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Christians are not void of intellectual capacity. I thought the church was going to say amen. And we must stop making it seem as though Christians are, to put it in Jamaican language, fool, fool. The fact that we lean on faith doesn't make us lacking in intellect. Because there are certain questions that you can ask intellectually that only faith can have a response for. 
not everything science can give an answer for. And as bright as the biologists and the physicists and the, uh, the, 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 the scientists are in today's day and world age, there are certain questions which are difficult to deal with, even for them. And I will tell you, it is hard for me to have faith in atheism. It is more sensible for me as an intellectual to have faith in creation. Intellectually, there it seems a lot of flaws in the argument there. But to get there, one has to engage in a dialogue, a question and answer, a, a probing, if you will, a, 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 an act of inquiry. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, along the journey of life, there are some of us who change our positions as we go along the way. Science changes positions as it goes along the way. When I was younger, I was taught that the world is flat. That's what I was taught. Since then, eh? Go again. <laughs> I don't understand these people over here. This is the bad section of the class. So, as time goes on, concepts and teachings and philosophies change. So, one time the world is round. And the other time we hear that it is flat, according to society. Well, it wasn't just the early Christians who had misunderstandings on the writings of Paul. And there are some individuals who feel that because, number one, there is a question on doctrine, that that means that the doctrine is in error. And there are some who believe, number two, that because the early pioneers might have held a particular viewpoint, that that viewpoint should be the viewpoint that must be carried all the way till Jesus comes. If that is part of your theology, you are missing last week's lecture's main point, that the path of the just is as a shining light. So the more you walk with Christ is the more you gain a deeper understanding of Christ. And there are people, and let me put it in this particular um, context. The early pioneers were not all at the time when they came together. They were not Seventh-day Adventists. They were Baptists, they were Methodists, they were Presbyterians, they were from denominations, but they all accepted the main point of the day that the second coming of Christ was revealed through the prophecy of Daniel 8.14. So they were united on one point of doctrine. But that did not take away their other viewpoints from the other various churches which they came from. Somebody is following me now. So everybody was united on 1844. 
everybody was, was, was aware as to the value of Daniel 8 verse 14. And they accepted and they embraced the interpretation advanced by William Miller and the Millerite movement. That Jesus was going to come according to their timeline in 1844. But that is so much as all of them actually believed. James White's belief at the beginning of the church is not James White's belief later on with the church. But there are some individuals who want to say because James White had a belief at that time that should be the only belief that we... Then why, do God, why does God give us minds to think and why does the scripture pastor say that the path of the just is as a shining light? So it wasn't just the early Christian church. And let me put this out there. If you go to the book of Acts, you will see that one of the largest or biggest points in the book of Acts is the fact that Peter got it wrong in terms of the interpretation of meat eating and, and its relationship to the new Christians. Peter got it wrong. So I see some Adventists getting shaky when they hear that our early pioneers got the, 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 the date wrong. And get, Peter got it wrong. Peter misunderstood, in fact, when when Paul came on and found him teaching and, and doing the separation, Paul said, listen me man, this is not the right way. And Paul taught him. And that was Peter. Peter who walked with Jesus. Peter who was able to make the great declaration to Jesus that thou art the Christ. So listen to me young minds and listen to me inquiring minds. The fact that we have gotten something wrong and the fact that we are probing a particular point and the fact that we are making inquiry, the fact even that we might make a misinterpretation does not mean that we are not going in the right direction. It does not mean that we are wrong. It does not mean that we are to throw out everything and leave the, 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 um, the Advent movement. What it means is that we must come together as the early pioneers did and pray and seek counsel from God. For the promise of God is sure. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. So I am always... Worried about the church. Two things. Number one, members in the church who feel they have a new light. They have a new light. So they go sit down somewhere and study. And they get some new light. And they just come, and it's like the church must just take it hook, line, and sinker. The church mustn't think it through and pray it over and get wide experience. And then the other thing is, the church must facilitate intellectual inquiry. We must facilitate conversation on difficult topics. We must be willing and open to learn and to grow and to test and to confirm or otherwise the positions that we hold. I am firm in my belief as a Seventh-day Adventist. But it has come through trial and testing and personal study. So I'm going to show you this evening how the Advent movement deals with these things. How the Advent me movement deals with intellectual minds who have questions that are probing and sharp. Come with me. In the early years of Adventism, I'm going to give you the, the trajectory. In the early years of Adventism, in the Millerite movement, let me start with the Millerite movement. 
The focus doctrine. No, let me go back to the Bible. In the Old Testament, because it was a polytheistic society, a society of many gods, you will see coming out in the Old Testament time and time again, monotheism. The concept was to be entrenched because in societies all around, there were multiple gods that individuals were worshipping. So that was the test for that time. When you come to the New Testament, the test for that time is not accepting the one God theology. That was settled. The test was accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah. So that was settled. And after accepting Jesus Christ as the Messiah became settled in the church, the new question of the, 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 the prophetic interpretation and the prophetic life of the church now became the focal point. How are you going to deal with Christ's words in Matthew 24, Mark 16, and Luke chapter 21? Outlining when Jerusalem was going to be overthrown. When the sun would be darkened. And so all of these things were taking its toll on the church and its developmental history of theology, of doctrine, of belief. So come to Adventism now. Come to the Millerite movement. And the Millerite movement started out with a focus on the second advent of Christ. So Jesus didn't come. We know that. But something else happened. There was this shift of focus from embracing the seventh, um, the, 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 um, the, 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 the second coming of Christ as the main truth of the day after the disappointment. To now accepting the law of God as still binding on Christians. So first, you had the, the, the focus on the second coming. After Jesus didn't come in 1844, we, we, there, there was now to be an embrace of the law of God as still binding, including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and as the memorial of his creation. And all of a sudden, the church found the Sabbath truth. And it went about teaching the Sabbath truth and started embracing the idea and the biblical teaching of the law of God as still binding upon Christians. And then when the Adventist church was formed, there were two major theological uh, views that were to be carried out in our name. Seventh day, relating to the, 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 the Sabbath of the Lord. And Adventists relating to the second coming. So Adventists now embrace this truth of the law of God. As I said last week, in last week's lecture, we did not always keep the Sabbath. We were once, in our early pioneer stage, we were once Sabbath breakers. We accepted it out of humility and willingness to walk in the light that the Lord shed along our pathway. And so, after this, the law now became the new thing to tell the people. So Adventists went around town and were teaching individuals that they are to keep the law of God and the law of God is eternal, just like I did yesterday. It's holy, it is just, it is good. The, 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 the law is perfect, converting the soul. They accepted and they embraced the doctrine of the law of God as still binding on Christians. And because we were speaking so much about the law, Adventists forgot about grace. Because we were so focused on the law, we were now being called legalists. 
Because our newfound doctrine was the law of God still binding, it became front and center the focal point of our message and our interaction. And that developed now a hardline relationship with many persons who worship on the first day of the week because we were tooting the law of God as still binding. And this was something strange to some people. Eh? <laughs> Here comes now. A brilliant mind. E. J. Wagner, 1855 to 1916. This man was a physician, a medical doctor. This man was a son of an Adventist minister. This man was the one who preached righteousness by faith, both preceding. And during the 1888 General Conference session, 44 years after the Great Disappointment, the Adventist Church was to get a rude awakening. A message was going to come to shatter the church with its newfound focus on the law of God, with its newfound understanding of the truth of God, with this newfound understanding of the law of God as being binding. Adventists were moving around the place and preaching about the law of God. And here was this young man, a very young man in the church at that time, came on the scene, and here is Wagner going about and telling individuals about the great message that it's righteousness by faith through Jesus Christ. Some Adventists would want to kick him out of the church. E.J. Wagner first served as a physician on the staff of the Battle Creek Sanitarium. However, his true love was evangelism. And so he gave up the practice of medicine and he entered into ministry. Two years after that, he joined his father, who was then J.H. Wagner and was then the editor of the magazine, The Signs of the Times. He joined the magazine and became co-editor along with a newfound friend, A.T. Jones. And A.T. Jones and Wagner now became the co-editors of the Signs of the Times. At the 1888 General Conference, now brethren, God has a way of working it out. God, they decided that they were going to give these two young people a chance to speak at the General Conference. Mighty God. We wish that we would even get some more young people to go to the General Conference. Moreover, to speak at the general conference. We must believe not just by giving the youth some opportunity to sing and to do play. We must believe in our young people to the extent that we expose them to biblical truth. And when we see them develop and maturing, we give them the opportunity to lead. But I know it's not many people follow that doctrine. Well, in 1888, the Lord would have had it that Wagner and Jones were to, uh, to, 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 to address the great gathering at the general conference session. And the general conference session was a focus, brothers and sisters, um, 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 Revelation chapter 12 and, you know, you know Revelation chapter 12, uh, uh, verse 17. Yes, man, and... Um, um, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. So let, let, let me read it for you. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
But Revelation 14 verse 12 was also brought into, into context, into view. It was the focal point. And here it says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now the traditional Adventist perspective on the faith of Jesus is that the faith of Jesus is, is, is related to the testimony of Jesus and the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Standard Adventist line. But here was two, you were two young men, two Bible scholars who saw more in the doctrine of the faith of Jesus than just something like what the traditionists said. They saw that the faith of Jesus who was you bank on Jesus to work out your own salvation. They, they, they saw the faith of Jesus as being representative of the message of righteousness by faith, that a man cannot be saved by works. And so they came to 1888 Minneapolis Conference. Oh Lord, and they started to teach and they started to share. Listen to what, listen to what Wagner said. Wagner says, we too often measure God and his love by ourselves and our love. Come on, church. That gets me a little away today. We too often measure God and his love by our message and our love. And brethren, when the ch when, when, this is part of his pre pre um, 1888 messaging that developed and blossomed and grew into the 1888 message. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he was saying to a church that was focused on the law. He says, quote, it is the death of Christ that brings us to God. Hallelujah. He says, what he asked the question, what is it that keeps us there? It is the life of Christ. We are saved by his life. Hold these words in your mind. Being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That was the man's message. A message focused on Christ. His work on our behalf, not our work on his behalf. Listen to what he says. As long as we have the Son of God, we have eternal life. That was the message that Wagner was developing and that God was framing in his mind. Yes, he was a Sabbath keeper. Yes, he believed in the law of God. But the law cannot save us, brethren. The law has no power to save. Wagner saw that through Jesus Christ and his merits on Calvary's cross, you and I as sinners can be saved. And he says, hang your hope upon that. He says, he says, it is the life of Christ working in us that delivers us from the sins of this present evil world. What a powerful word. It's the life of Christ. The life of Christ. He says, the life of Christ is divine what church? Power. And then... He says, the just shall live by faith because Christ lives in them. I am crucified with Christ, he quotes the Apostle Paul. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Church, let me tell you something. In as much as the Bible enjoins upon the Christian to keep the commandments of the living God, in as much as the law of God is still binding, rest assured sinner man, rest assured weary woman, rest assured long-standing Seventh-day Adventist, the law of God cannot cleanse the soul. The law of God 
God converts the soul. But what the man of sin, man that is known as a sinner needs, is a cleansing agent for the soul. He needs something powerful to wash and to cleanse and to renew. And what can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There is power in the blood. We preach the law, but we must lift up the cross. We preach the Sabbath, but we must lift up Jesus Christ. In the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. We don't have to have one without the other. We can have the two of them together. We can keep the law, knowing that the law will not save us. And knowing that when we break the law, we still have redemption through Jesus Christ to redeem us from our transgression of the law. The life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith of the Son of God. By faith. Hmm. A.T. Jones. The, 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 the twin of Wagner, A.T. Jones, joined the army, the United States Army, brilliant men. And he was a forceful preacher about righteousness by faith. Forceful preacher. He came and he, he, he was co-editor with Wagner. And they immersed themselves in study of the word. And they found precious gems and brought those precious gems and gave it to church. The church that was legalistic, the church that was focused on the law and said to them, here is a remedy for you. The love of God, the blood of Jesus, the righteousness of Christ. Let me tell you something. Every other religion in the world, apart from Christianity, you have to do something to be saved. There is no other faith that has someone dying for, the, for, 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 for them. There is no other faith that takes the cross. A symbol of shame, a symbol of 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 utter embarrassment in before the entire universe. There's no other religion that takes it and holds it up as a powerful token and light of truth to the brokenhearted. It is to let us know we cannot buy our way into heaven. It is to let us know our good works will not get us into heaven. I didn't say we must have good works because the Bible says in Titus, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men teaching us that the nine godly ungodliness and worldly loss we are to live soberly and righteously and godly in this present earth he says we must be zealous of good works but after you're zealous of good works you're still not going to get saved by it jamaicans love visa and i remember days when the U.S. Embassy was not where it was. It was at another location. And people used to come from 3, 4 o'clock in the morning or even before from country to make sure they line up the place and sleep out there. Because when you miss your visa appointment, you know, dog me, I'm your supper. For the foreigners, you have no hope. That's what it means. Not no hope. And in order to get the visa, brethren, you have to pay the visa fee. You have to fill out the, the, the visa application form. But paying the fee and filling out the form will not make you get the visa. You're not going to get the visa because you pay the fee. <laughs> You're not going to get the visa because you fill out the form. You're not even going to get the visa because you show up at the embassy with a long line of, 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 of bank accounts and, and letters from who. That is not, as a matter of fact, well, there's some theories on the road as to how you, oh, 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 eh, but eh, 
<laughs> you better pray if you spend your fifteen thousand dollars and and all of that to get everything. You better pray so when you reach up there, that 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 person is on the right side. Or the quota, as them say, no, no cut. If, if anything goes on. I don't know it goes, but I hear so there's a quota. And if it, you know, so that's what I hear. <laughs> but let me come back here. I said, getting the interview, paying the money, attending the interview, that way, is that guarantee for the visa? Whatever the system they have to give you the visa is their system. And it looks like it's based on grace and mercy and favor. A.T. Jones began preaching for the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1873. Twelve years later, he and E.J. Wagner, as I said before, became editors of the Signs of the Times. He served as editor of the Review from 1897 to 1901, and he wrote voluminously a lot. He wrote a lot of literature for us. Unfortunately, because of his ties with the great Dr. J. H. Kellogg, he cut ties with the church. I, I don't... It's very interesting. The Lord has given this church some of the brightest minds. Kellogg was bright in her brethren. Those who don't know, you know. Kellogg is that man who invented cornflakes, you know. Kellogg cornflakes was Adventist. Yeah. When you, every time you see Kellogg cornflakes, this man, Dr. J.H. Kellogg, was in charge of the Battle Creek Sanitarium for years. And then somehow, you know, he started to get some other little doctrines and pantheism. And he started to... And the beautiful thing about it, even when he was diverting off, Ellen White still maintained contact with him to try to keep him on the right path. Well, they said he perhaps converted again on his deathbed, I don't know. But he says, listen to what he wrote. Then the law is first to bring us unto Christ. And after it has led us to Christ and we have found him, found him, then it witnesses that that is what has actually happened. So first, it gives the knowledge of sin. And second, it witnesses to the righteousness of God that is by faith. And so, Wagner, in that beautiful statement, J Jones rather, summarizes how the law and righteousness comes together. And this was what he advanced. He advanced in his sermon on February 26, 1893. Listen to what he says. Do we look to the law for righteousness? And the congregation answered, No. And he says, even after we have been brought to Christ, do we look there for righteousness? And the congregation answers, no. And he asks the question, where do we look for righteousness? And he says, we look in the face of Jesus Christ. There, we all with open face behold him as in a glass. The glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, from righteousness to righteousness, from character to character, from goodness to goodness, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what was Jones' statement? What was the message that Jones wanted us to hear? We was, he wanted us to know beyond any shadow of a doubt. That when we look in the face of Jesus, we become transformed. He wanted us to know that when we lay aside our, on our own righteousness, we can take on the garments of Christ's righteousness. 
He wanted the sinner man to know he doesn't have to stay there plunging in his sins, feeling guilty over and over again, but that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, and sinners that plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sinners that plunge beneath that flood lose all their their guilty stains. You don't have to sit with your mess. You don't have to stay in your sins. You don't have to be enamored by guilt and fear of your past. The scripture tells us by faith you can accept the merits of Christ, your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, who died on Calvary's cross on your behalf. And by faith, believe that you're forgiven. By faith, Believe that you are cleansed. By faith, believe that you are healed. By faith, believe that God has delivered you. And by faith, you shall be. No wonder Jesus said, your faith. You know, as much as some people are prayer warriors, you know. <laughs> the scripture tells us, you know, is there any man sick among you? Let him call for the elders. But let me tell you something. If you call for all the elders, and at Andrews we have 24 around the throne. If you call for all the elders, and you don't have the faith that what the elders praying for is going to be done, all the elders' faith can't save you. Your faith is personal. Your faith is dependent on you. It's your faith that will make you whole. So this is the Minneapolis conference. Look at them. Mercy. This is a nice old picture, you know. I think I... No? Yeah, I think one of them is somewhere in the sanctuary. Um, yes, the Minneapolis conference. Yes, brethren. This was the conference that shook up the church. All of these people, these are they. That's a real Adventist picture. And if you look right around the background there where Ella Murray is, you see the Advent pioneers from that day. The, the, this was the 1888 Minneapolis conference. And at this general conference, as we do at all general conferences, we, we have discussions on points of faith and points of belief and, and, and points of doctrine and points of policy. And at this general conference, there were four particular discussions that were held. Four. The first one was on the nature of Christ and the Godhead. So those of you who think that the controversy in the Adventist church you now among some individuals in relation to the Godhead or the Trinity or the nature of God, what, whichever of them you want to use, is something new. It's not new. It's not anything new. It is as old perhaps as this denomination. Not anything new. So that was the first one. The second one was on the atonement. The atonement of Jesus Christ. At one meant God making reconciliation with man. God bringing that man into unison with him. The third was on the Huns versus the Alemanes and which kingdom it is that would replace Rome. That debate. They spent a lot of time talking about that. When I tell you your church gives thought to these things, you should believe me. And number four, the issue of law and grace. And that's where Wagner and, 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 and Jones came in. And that's where Wagner and Jones came and shook up the place. Now in the book, The Light Bearers, uh, A History of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we get some further insights as to how the thing actually unfolded with Wagner and Jones and this very special, unique message. 
The author states that on the law and grace debate, Dr. Wagner refused to be drawn into the debate over the law in Galatians chapter 3. The real point, he argued, affirmed, is that all, is that all any law can do is to demonstrate man's sinfulness and his inability to justify himself before God. So he says that's all that the law could do. But Wagner was enthusiastic over the divine remedy available to all who have faith to believe. So he stated that Christ, in whom dwell all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, stood anxious to cover the repentant sinner with his own robe of righteousness, thus making him acceptable before God. Christ also stood just as ready to impart victory over future sins as to forgive those that were in the past. That was Wagner's message. He was not just focused on the fact. He was focused on the remedy. And he says, Jesus Christ is the remedy. He pointed the people to the merits of Jesus Christ and his righteous robe. However, on the other hand, the traditionalist camp was very surprised at the impact of Wagner's studies. <laughs> at one point in the proceedings, Ella R. M. Kilgore, who was a member of the General Conference Committee, moved that any further discussion of righteousness by faith be postponed until some later time when Elder Butler could be present. Who was Elder Butler? Elder Butler was the general conference president. And he was also the review ed editor. And, uh, uh, no, the general conference president and the review editor, Uriah Smith, took particular exception to the exegesis of Galatians 3 as promoted by Wagner and Jones. Oh, I should say, although the series is not focusing on Uriah Smith, we, the, Advent, the Advent movement owes a debt of gratitude to God for the work and the ministry of Uriah Smith. Most Seventh-day Adventists would know his seminal work, which I come to that after, the, book, the two books, um, Daniel and Revelation, a lot of our early understanding of the book of Daniel and Revelation was unpacked and unraveled through the intense research of Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith wasn't a lightweight person. And when you read his work, you'll realize he had extensive research. He did his background checks. And when he came out to speak, he was always so refreshing and so trying to make complicated topics very simple in the minds of the ordinary man. And we owe, a great, uh, we owe a debt of gratitude. Although today, um, we do acknowledge that there are some areas of his theological concept in the book of Daniel and Revelation in his commentary that are not as should be. Because light has continued to shine. And we continue to use the languages to understand and to perfect. But the fact that he did what he did helped us to get where we are today. And we should be grateful to him for what he has done. So the Westerners, this was the significant impact now as I wrap up. The Westerners had reverted to the early Seventh-day Adventist position that the law Paul here referred to as the schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ was the whole body of moral law, including the Ten Commandments. This position, Adventists had a, almost entirely abandoned during the 1860s and the 1870s. Elder J.H. Morrison expressed fear 
that Wagner's message was diverting attention. Watch here now. He expressed fear that Wagner's message was diverting attention away from the special message Adventists had been commissioned to give during the earth's final hour, the need to return to explicit obedience to the Sabbath commandment. So there was the vision. There was the vision. Some felt, some felt that the message that Wagner and Jones came from, there were really two camps. There were those who enthusiastically embraced the message of Wagner and Jones of righteousness by faith. And then there was the other camp who felt that this continuous promotion of righteousness by faith was undermining the message of the law of God being binding upon Christians. And so Wagner and Jones took up Revelation 14 and explained, verse 12, that the faith of Jesus is not just to be known or to be expounded on as, as, as the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, but to let individuals know the faith of Jesus also includes having faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And so they shared that word. They shared that word. Wagner and Jones presented a unique rebuttal. They confirmed they confined themselves simply. This was powerful. So this is the, the GC. And the debate is going back and forth. So they decided they were going to do something. And they confined themselves to just reading 16 passages of scripture without any commentary. They just read the scripture. And that had a very strong impression on the minds of those who were in the congregation. One in observer said it made a last everlasting impression that time can never efface. For these two young men, the aim was that, quote, righteousness by faith must become more, much more than an abstract doctrinal theory. It must be a living reality. A precious experience transforming the life of believers. And I say, Amen. The church needed the message that came to it in 1888. The church needed the reminder that even though we are Sabbath keepers, and even though we believe that the law is still binding. The church needed the message that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus and his righteousness. It's all about Jesus and his sacrifice. It's all about Jesus and his blood and the fact that he gave his life as a ransom for many. And so, brothers and sisters, even though 1888 has come and gone, the opposition refused to admit defeat. I don't think I like how the historian put it, opposition. But in what was without doubt the saddest aspect of the conference, prejudice, jealousy degenerated into open criticism and jesting in the halls and boarding house where the delegates stayed. Wagner and Jones became the laughing stock of the delegates who didn't embrace the message that came to them in 1888. I ask the church today, are we likewise rejecting the message that the Lord is sending to us? 
1888 Minneapolis Conference happened 44 years after the Great Disappointment. And it continues to be referred to as a watershed moment in STA church history. When we see a young person fall for breaking any of the commandments, do we demonstrate the central philosophy and the teaching of righteousness by faith? When we see a brother or a sister going in the wrong direction, when we hear something about our brother or sister, do we demonstrate the central tenet of the 1888 Minneapolis Conference? That conference, the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, remains to this very day one of the most studied, intriguing, interesting, researched areas in the history of this denomination. Two young men came with a message that was born from heaven to help the church to set its house in order. Some rejected some accepted. It's the same thing today. You will hear the same message that someone else hears. One will go away safe. And the next will go away lost. One will be willing to embrace truth. And the other is willing to stay with the status quo. One is willing to advance in biblical light. Not lights of their own creation. Biblical light. And the other is willing to reject and oppose. You know what I find amazing? En route to Canaan's land. The very pillar that brought light to the Israelites brought darkness to the Egyptians. The very God who opened the Red Sea for his people closed it on those who rejected him. We can be in the same place going through the same experience and it has a different impact on all of us. Are we open to listening to the voice of God? Are we willing when new light comes along our way that lines up with the fundamental biblical teachings? Are we willing to advance with it or are we willing to be opposers of it? Do we reject the truth because of whom God sends to give it to us? Or do we accept it in mercy, knowing that it's God who is speaking individually to our own hearts. Whatever you want to say, and the historians have a lot to say about the 1888 Minneapolis Conference. Whatever you want to say, it comes back down to each of us individually, even within the church community, even within the Advent church. Having a personal understanding and a personal relationship with God for herself. So tonight, right where you are, I invite you to bow your heads. And I don't know the truth that God has spoken to your heart. I don't know what God is calling you to 
give up or to walk from. I don't know what God is calling you to walk into. I don't know what God is asking you to, to let go of. But I'm saying right now, have a conversation with God. Because in 1888, Jesus Christ himself was at that general conference. But how many heard his voice? Break Break down the bread of life. Okay. My faith looks up to thee. We're going to close in that song. Let's stand tonight. My faith looks up to thee. My faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Calvary. Savior divine, now hear me while I pray. Take all my guilt away. Oh, let me from this day. Thy rich grace impart strength to my fainting heart. My zeal inspire as thou hast died for me. May my love to thee pure, warm, and changeless be a living fire. While life's dark maze I thread. And griefs around me spread. Be thou my guide. Bid darkness turn today. Wipe sorrow's tears away. let me ever stray from thee aside sovereign God we were not there in 1888 when you showed up in that great conference Knocking on the hearts of individuals to let them see beyond the law. To experience grace. To experience your righteousness. We see ourselves in that story. Some of us hardened by the truth. We come to you this evening recognizing, Lord, that it is your desire for us to walk in truth. To live in your light. 
not to reject your truth, not to reject your light. Light which aligns with your revealed word. Light which stands on the pillars that you have given to your church. So Lord, individually, if we have rejected any message, if we have been disobedient to any message that you have been given to us individually, we ask for your forgiveness tonight. And we pray, Lord, that you may give us the courage and the impetus and the wisdom to make the wrong spaces in our lives right with you. For those who are struggling with spiritual identity, with spiritual inquiry, for those who are struggling with guilt and past and fears, I pray, Lord, that they may experience your son's righteousness alive in their lives. May it come to life beyond the teaching of Romans. May they see those precious words that God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. May it come alive in someone's mind. May the truth of your word that though we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity that we can experience a newness with you. Come alive in someone's experience. May the truth that you will forgive us of our sins when we confess, forsake, may come alive in someone's life. May the truth that you are a burden bearer and you will bear our sins come alive in the heart of someone who tonight is grieving their past and, their, and is swallowed up with guilt and who is filled with all kinds of negative emotions and insecurities because of what they know of themselves and their past and their history. May somebody come to grips tonight, Almighty Father, that the blood of Jesus still has remarkable power, that sin can be can be broken, that the chains can be broken, that they can rise up to a newness of life tonight. Bring the truth of the righteousness of Christ to the forefront of the mind of someone tonight. And for all of us, Lord, allow us to so live that others can be so attracted because each day we are beholding Jesus and we are being changed from image to image, from glory to glory. May this be your experience. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Live in fire. Amen. Amen. I want to say thank you to all of you who are in our online space, whether on EJC Virtual Church or right here with us at the Angels Memorial SDA Church's YouTube platform. We're happy to have you this evening. We are not going to be streaming again until Sabbath morning. Those of you who are in tutorial groups, I'm going to ask you, come early. You, all, you, you did so well last week. You came in on time, almost 300 individuals. We want you to come again this week and let us delve into this doctrine of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Until then, join us in singing. Just over the mountain, the promised land, lies a holy city built by God's own hand. As our weary footsteps gain the mountain's crest, we can view our homeland of eternal rest. We are nearing home. We are nearing home. Have yourselves a wonderful week and see you, God willing, on Saturday.